Hey guys, it's Wraith. This is chapter 31, the start of volume three in the audiobook series. I want to remind you that we have audiobooks available because, unfortunately, there will be some heavy edits in chapters to come to the public podcast chapters. And these aren't just for the romantic scenes between our two gay vampire couples, although there are a ton of those, but also now for disturbing fictional content. It's adult content in the sense of what it talks about is, is adult. The unedited chapters are available in volume three of the audiobook and also the member's private podcast feed on wraithrain.com. In fact, members are already 15 chapters ahead of the public podcast, or even more, depending on when you're listening to this episode. Link to both the membership signup and the audiobooks from the shop are in the notes below. Lost on Everdark, Julian and Damon headed to Wingate, only to find more of Kaymorn's confessors waiting to attack. Damon chose to use this as a training experiment for Julian and watched with satisfaction as his fledgling took down vampires hundreds of years older than him. But while Damon and Julian won that fight, they didn't win the one with Christian's parents. Liz Thorne is intent on having Julian, Damon, Christian, and Balthazar over for dinner, and she won't take no for an answer. Now we turn back to Christian and Balthazar to see what they've been up to. Everdark Episode 31. Mirror, Mirror. It was a good speech, Balthazar. I could tell that the other members of the house felt very confident and knew what to do after it. Christian said, referring to the pep talk Balthazar had given to House Ravenscroft before they'd jumped into a car for another death ride as Christian thought of it. He was only speaking about this because he was trying to keep his mind off of Balthazar's driving. His gaze flickered over to the odometer on the Tesla and gulped. Eighty. In a thirty-mile-per-hour zone? He clutched the seatbelt as Balthazar angrily shifted. I wouldn't have imagined that you like speeches, Balthazar said, tense despite the compliment. There was a faint flash of preening, though. But it was faint. That wasn't a good sign. What's wrong? Christian asked through clenched teeth. They had just blown through a yellow light. He was positive that they were going to be flashing lights behind them any moment, or a death. Nothing. What do you mean? Balthazar had taken his eyes off the road. For God's sake, eyes forward! Christian yelled. Balthazar chuckled and went back to driving the Tesla at what amounted to supersonic speeds with only one hand negligently on the wheel. You're such a grandma when it comes to driving. I'm not a grandmother on the road or anywhere else. You're driving like a maniac. Christian's knuckles were white. Vampire reflexes. Remember? Balthazar took both hands off the wheel. Christian manfully resisted the urge to grab the wheel himself. Even if your reflexes are extraordinary? They are. Other people's aren't. And people are unpredictable, too. You could be put in a position where, no matter how adept you are, there won't be any way out. Christian pointed out and squeezed his eyes shut as someone foolishly opened a door to their car as they barreled past. You didn't mind my driving on the highway the other night, Balthazar said with a frown. You're driving even more aggressively this evening than before, which is why I think you must be upset about something, Christian explained. He would not cover his face with his hands and peer between his fingers like a child. Besides, he was too busy clutching onto the seatbelt with all his might. You've been like this since the oneness, and you should have been thrilled about that. Power and connection and better things for you and the house. Balthazar's lips flattened, but finally he let out a sigh. <sighs> I suppose I can tell you about this, but you cannot tell anyone else. Well, Julian will likely know, as Damon will have told him, but no one else. Master fledgling secret. He glanced over at Christian. To stop him from looking away from the road, Christian blurted out, Okay, fine, fine. I, I won't tell anyone. Just eyes on the road. Balthazar went back to negligently driving, and Christian swore that he would be the one in charge of the wheel from here on out in their relationship. All right, all right. Calm, my child. I have things under control. Balthazar pursed his lips and said, Damon told me that I'm Iros reborn. At first, that made no sense. Reborn? Reincarnation? 
That was a real thing. Christian had to order his mind around this new information. Finally, he said, Does he actually know this? I mean, what evidence is there for that? Or is he just comparing you in personality to Iros? He's not comparing. I am Iros. He's sure. And I... I can feel things, which means that he's right. Balthazar's lips writhed back from his teeth as he muttered, Of course I would be Iros. If I had to be any of the immortals reborn, it would be him. Christian guessed that this was why they'd had all that discussion about Iros earlier. He tried to absorb this fact, which meant he needed data. All right, so you're Iros reborn. What does that actually mean? Mean? Balthazar's brows drew together in confusion. Christian wasn't surprised that so far all Balthazar had thought about were the downsides. He had a feeling that Balthazar was always a glass-half-empty type of individual. I mean, what's changed about you since he said that? And are there any changes you can expect in the future because of it? I don't... I don't know. I didn't ask. Balthazar's forehead bunched further. Maybe you should ask, Christian suggested. I understand that you're worried about his, or your, I guess, old reputation rubbing off on your current one, but there may be benefits you get from this. Other than being hated, perhaps? You've lived as an exile for a while now, so being liked and accepted can't be at the core of your desires. That aspect of being Iros can't bother you. You didn't hesitate to kill Roan, even though you knew that you would likely die yourself, or never be accepted in vampire society ever again. Christian pointed out. Actually, I did hesitate. An awful lot. And I rather hate myself for that. Balthazar gave the road a thin smile. Well, because you didn't do something that was both incredibly brave, but also might lead to something even more terrible for you? Christian shook his head. I'm glad you thought about it. I'm glad you weighed it all out. I'm proud, though, that after all that weighing, you still did what you did and accepted the consequences. It was the right thing to do. It was a heroic thing. There was a long silence from Balthazar. Christian chanced looking over at him. Balthazar appeared thoughtful. Some of the tension had drained out of him. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate that, Balthazar said quietly. You're welcome. There was a warm, comfortable silence. But back to the fact of you being Iros reborn. I know you don't want to tell anyone. I absolutely don't. Balthazar swiped one hand through the air, but thankfully still kept one hand on the wheel. Well, being someone reborn is not being the person. You have your own reputation. There's no reason for anyone to know, unless, like we talked about, there are going to be changes to you that others will figure out, Christian said. Balthazar nodded. I will discuss what this means with Damon later. I promise. Maybe nothing will change. Maybe. Balthazar then brought them to a tire screeching halt, outside of what looked like a three-story brownstone apartment. The area was very residential. Christian saw few lights on in any of the other brownstones that lined the quiet, tree-shaded street. He saw no evidence of people walking to and from the brownstone, as he imagined they would. The street felt asleep. He frowned as he asked, I thought we were going to the House Margulies' blood den to review some of their candidates for acolytes. We are, Balthazar answered as they parked. But this is a residential area. Christian pointed out as they left the car and stepped onto the leafy sidewalk. So? Balthazar cocked an eyebrow up. But a blood den is like a bar, right? Christian carefully chose his words. From what he had seen of the siren blood den, that's what it had looked like to him. One of those swank new cocktail bars that specialized in hip cocktails with liqueurs he'd never heard of. Except, of course, blood dens provided blood. And likely, more blood. Do you recall that the siren blood den also looked like an abandoned building on the outside? Balthazar asked as he gestured for Christian to follow him up the half-flight of stone steps, framed by an elaborate black iron railing. Ah, oh, yeah, so this is a cover? He pointed to the brownstone's facade. It is indeed. Balthazar grinned and knocked three times on the front door. A symbol shaped rather like a shard of glass suddenly glowed like a neon sign on the door's surface, and the door opened of its own accord. The silent night was broken by the sounds of raucous laughter and talking. Christian found himself curling inwards as the sound hit his sensitive ears. Balthazar squeezed his shoulders and the sounds dimmed. Sorry about that. I forgot that you need help shielding. 
There are so many things I need to teach you, and it's hard to know which one should take first priority. There's also the fact that you hide any inadequacies you have behind this hyper-competence, Balthazar mused, which makes me forget how new you are to all of this. Christian straightened. I am hyper-competent, and I expect to master whatever you have to teach me quickly so I will not be dependent or a burden. Balthazar reached to caress his face, but stopped at the last moment, and Christian regretted he had. You could never be a burden. But there's a lot to learn. Now, come, let us start a lesson about the Mirror Bloodline. I want to prepare you for what's to come. So here are the upcoming chapters that have cuts. This one has a small cut. Small edits in chapter 33, and then the cuts to 34 and 35 are so big that I recorded a summary of events that take place there. Otherwise, the chapters just wouldn't make sense. There are small edits to 36 and 37. The editor usually posts numbers of cut paragraphs or sentences in the notes, so you can check them out for what we've had to edit. Christian followed Balthazar into the hubbub. The interior of the brownstone was what he would have expected. There was a staircase to their left that led to the upper floors, a wide, gracious hallway headed deeper into the brownstone, and small, cozy rooms with bow windows were off to the right. People were everywhere. It seemed like every square inch of space was filled with people talking, laughing, dancing, kissing. The silver eyes of the vampires were sprinkled throughout like salt in a pepper pot. There were far more humans, though, than he had seen at the Siren Blood Den. The next section of the podcast has been edited out to keep it suitable for a general audience. Christian was about to quickly look away when the vampire's silver eyes met his, and then the vampire's face changed. Christian gasped as he was looking at himself. He grabbed Balthazar's arm. Balthazar? He's me. Balthazar covered Christian's hand with his own. No, no, that's the mirror's gift, the ability to look like anyone. Look around. See, there's another you and another me. Oh, and there are triplets that look suspiciously like Tom Cruise. As Christian gazed around the room, he saw exactly what Balthazar was talking about. The faces of the vampires in the room shifted. Like liquid wax, they changed from woman to man to woman again and sometimes in between. They reflected his face and each other's. It was both fascinating and revolting. He found himself drawing close to Balthazar. How do you know what any of them really look like? Christian asked. You don't, Balthazar shrugged. People think that house mirror vampires choose ugly people to join them. That way they aren't attached to their original looks and won't mind a change. Beauty is only skin deep, Christian murmured and shook himself. Are they actually changing form, or, or just our perception of them? Another good question. I can say that I've had sex with a few of them, and they seemed to be what they were advertising. But one can never tell, after all. I could make any of them believe I had wings, he answered. Christian felt a welling of fascination inside of him. The scientist in him couldn't believe that such questions had gone unanswered. Was there no method about the vampires and their gifts? Balthazar read his expression and perhaps his mind. I can see your little mind whirring over time. You think we are very foolish not to have investigated this? Yes, Christian admitted. The gift is the greatest treasure a vampire has. Letting others know how they work and the limits of them, well, it isn't a very good idea. As much as we are all vampires, we're in competition too, Balthazar explained. So while I'm sure the Mirror know how their gifts work, they aren't sharing that information. But joint research could lead to so much more knowledge, Christian cried. Balthazar looked at him so fondly, as if he were a sweet innocent. It would, but it's not happening. At least, not yet. Maybe Damon will give us more insight. After all, he's said to have all the powers. We've seen him perform a lot of them, Christian pointed out. We have. Balthazar still looked a little stunned about that. I'll be asking him about all of them. And you should too. We need to learn, Christian retorted. Yes, I'm sure he has a lot to teach us. Balthazar nodded. And hopefully he won't be too tight-lipped. 
Bulky, there you are, old man. We've been waiting ages for you. Thought you might not come if the rumors were true. A young man with a flamboyant British accent called down the stairs. Christian stiffened, thinking automatically that the rumors had to be about Damon and Nightfallen. But Balthazar was steady as a rock. His expression betrayed nothing of any concern he might feel. He put a hand on the base of Christian's spine to comfort him. Christian wondered if he was preparing to single-handedly cause this whole blood den to have amnesia too. Charlie, I would never let you down, Balthazar said smoothly. Oh, dear boy, you have, and you will. But I'll always forgive you because you're my favorite Iros ever, Charlie cooed. Charlie's voice was soon followed by his person. He looked to be about twenty with the unblemished skin of an aristocrat. He had a mop of boyish brown curls, which should have been accompanied by big brown eyes, but they were silver instead. He was thin and languid. He wore an elegant tuxedo whose elegance was not marred by the fact that the bow tie was undone, as were three of the buttons of his shirt. He was leaning rather heavily on a red-headed girl who was doing her best to keep him upright. He made it to the bottom of the stairs, and he regarded Balthazar and then Christian. His eyes focused startlingly fast on Christian, becoming sharp and intuitive, whereas before they had been bleary. Was he only playing at being drunk? Christian wondered. Can vampires get drunk? If the person who they're drinking from is drugged or drunk, do vampires experience that? So many questions. But Charlie's vampire eyes were causing Christian to curl against Balthazar again. He'd always held his own in a fight, but he wasn't as strong as Julian by a long shot. He'd taken self-defense courses and various martial arts classes over the years, yet here he knew he was outmatched. There was something about Charlie that completely cowed him. Maybe it was the fact that he didn't really know what Charlie looked like. He could be this laconic young man, or he could be something utterly different. What rumors are you hearing, Charlie? Balthazar smoothed his free hand down the front of his chest and put on one of his cat-like smiles of conquest. In the past, Christian would have been annoyed at such a look, but now he was understanding that this was part of Balthazar's facade. Just like the mirror bloodline vampires put on different faces, Balthazar just picked up invisible masks. This one was the playboy. <laughs> You dirty dog, Charlie laughed drunkenly, brushing a hand down Balthazar's arm. Pretending your big secrets isn't huddling against you like a lamb. You've got a fledgling. Oh, bulky. He's lovely. What's his name? If there had been any tension in Balthazar, it now would have drained out of him. Balthazar having a fledgling wasn't a secret, but then again... If these vampires knew who Christian was. His name is Christian, Balthazar said without expanding on the introduction. But that didn't stop Charlie from figuring it out. He's the one on that vampire hunting show, isn't he? Charlie told the redhead. You know, there's the brawny adventurer type, looks before he leaps, very pretty too. And then our more slender, cerebral hero here, he pointed at Christian who pulls his buddy's butt out of the fire. Isn't that right, chappy? The last was directed at him. Balthazar, though, smoothly answered. They finally found the vampires they were looking for. The redhead giggled and put one hand up to her bow-like lips. Are you still gonna pretend to look for vampires, Christian? I suppose we'll have to. If we keep looking and allegedly find nothing, well, all the better. Oh, <laughs> oh, I so want to be a guest star. I could be one of those people who claim to have seen a vampire. Charlie was giggling like mad. Oh, me too. The redhead clapped her hands with enthusiasm. Balthazar gave them tight smiles. We'll negotiate something for your brief forays into stardom. Don't let him fool you, Charlie winked. I used to be on the stage. I imagine your gift must make you a natural actor, Christian said. They all went still. The laughter and talking stopped. Was he not to have mentioned their gift? He went on quickly. Now, I only meant that taking on another's face or body is nothing, if you can't get the personality down with it. Charlie beamed as bright as the sun. 
and the redhead nodded like a bobblehead doll. You understand? Charlie came over and took Christian's arm. Christian did not flinch away, but tried to appear unconcerned. So many of the other bloodlines believe it's just a magic trick, you know? Look like someone else. What good is that? Well, they must have a lack of imagination if they think that. Your gift is amazing, Christian said honestly. Charlie squeezed his arm and looked past him to Balthazar, who was watching on with a small smile. But Christian could sense that he was watching very carefully. If Charlie or the redhead or anyone did anything to Christian, he would act. Christian felt incredibly treasured, but also unnerved at how close to the surface Balthazar's predatory side seemed. He wondered if anybody else noticed. He hardly had that thought before Charlie released his arm and gently pushed him towards Balthazar with an airy. Your fangs are showing bulky. You're in that tiresome stage where everything is a threat to the newborn. You've got me there, Charlie, Balthazar laughed, but there was a slight dark undertone to it. Balthazar put a protective arm around Christian's shoulders, which Christian found himself grateful for, which was a little unnerving in itself. Needing protection from Balthazar, a good thing. Yet he wasn't a fool. He knew that in this blood den, even though he was a vampire, he was an other, because he was an Iros and an exile. Charlie gave a little delighted shiver as he regarded the two of them. Darcy, he said to the redhead, we must play these two for Halloween. We could charge people just to watch us snuggle. Darcy nodded and grinned. Christian was grateful that her face didn't morph into his at that moment. I hate to move things along, Charlie, but Christian and I have some other business to attend to this evening, Balthazar said smoothly. Of course, of course. Come, this way. Our candidates are upstairs, Charlie gestured back towards the stairs. Instead of staggering up them as he had staggered down, Charlie lightly leaped up them three at a time as lightly as a deer. No longer was he drunk, if he ever had been. Darcy, who had on platform heels, struggled as best she could back up the stairs. Christian saw Balthazar's jaw twitch at their slow progress behind her. But Christian already knew that Balthazar was too much of a gentleman to go around her. Finally, they reached the top of the first set of stairs, and thankfully this was as far as they needed to go. Charlie was leaning against the doorway to a room where there were two men and a woman inside all looking as if they were there for a job interview. But Christian didn't have a chance to truly look at them before Balthazar was standing between him and a beautiful black woman at the end of the hall. She froze and stared at him, then at Charlie. Fiona, Balthazar hissed, but then he shook his head. Not Fiona. But still, his head snapped towards Charlie, who was looking quite wide-eyed himself. One of your people wouldn't just happen to be wearing her looks randomly now, would they? No. She was here, recently. What was Fiona Dark Silver here for, Charlie? Charlie gave a little tittering laugh. Oh, dear. Are the rest of the rumors true then as well? Join us next time for Episode 32, Want to Meet the Vampire King? If you're enjoying this podcast, please consider buying a membership to WraithRain.com or buying the downloadable audiobooks from our shops. Not only will you get the full, unedited chapters, but you'll be supporting the Everdark and the development of more works like this. As a small publisher, we are supported directly and only by you, our readers and listeners. You're the ones who make all this possible, and we are really grateful for your continued interest and support. Thanks so much. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley, Jay Thelis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart, with Liz Gentle as Seer, edited by Matthew Prince, continuity by Adriel Wiggins. Everdark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reed Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.